Good morning, everyone. And what beautiful weather Auckland has turned on. Uh, Mike Willis, he was due to peak today, but he had a fall and broke his hip. And so I'm just a pinch hitter. Mike Willis, he is very famous on Australian television, and he gave away Christ completely. And he has a beautiful conversion story. And uh, now he's a, a deeply committed uh, follower of the Lord. Someone wrote a book about Australians and he described Australians and the title of the book is the same. They're a weird mob. Some weird things certainly happen in Australia. Uh, there's a rather weird tombstone out uh, west of Sydney. Now the young people might not be familiar with the term Batman. A Batman is a term in the British military, a servant of an officer, makes cups of tea and policies issues and so forth. Well, on this tombstone is written, sacred to the memory of Richard James Llewellyn Jones of the Coldstream Guards, accidentally shot by his batman. And then underneath is the scripture text, well done, good and faithful servant. <laughs> When I was a, a seminarian, which is about a hundred years ago, there was a word often used uh, concerning the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It was unction, like a talk or a book had unction if it made you sense the presence of the Holy Spirit. And last Wednesday, there was a different wording, but remember the Emmaus disciples? They meet Jesus, they don't recognize him, and he explains the scriptures. And after he disappears, they say, weren't our hearts burning within us? That's the action of the Holy Spirit. We have the expression, someone has fire in his belly. Great determination, great conviction. St. Ignatius of Loyola had a tremendous influence on spirituality. Back in the year 1621, the 21st of May, the Battle of Pamplona took place. Ignatius was a soldier with very little interest in God. And in that battle he was felled by a cannonball that uh, wounded one leg and, and shattered the, leg, the bone of the other. He spent many years, uh, many months recuperating. Now, Ignatius loved novels about heroic knights saving fair ladies. And there were no such books in the hospital to his disappointment. He was bored stiff. There were two books there, one on the life of Christ and the other on saints like Francis of Assisi. Now, he didn't want to read them. He thought they'd be terribly dull and boring. But there was nothing else to do, so he began to read. And this is when he had his first discernment, a word that is very important in Ignatian's nation spirituality. He realized that when he read a novel, he began with great enthusiasm. But when he finished it, he felt kind of flat and disappointed because he knew it was a novel, it wasn't true. And when he read The Life of Christ, he didn't want to begin. But as he read, something began to happen. He began to say, this is true. This is very important. Maybe I could be something like this. And a peace came, a peace that lasted for days. That was his very first discernment. Spiritual writers speak of the need for us to read spiritual books, books that speak to our heart. If we don't do that, our prayer tends to become dull. Seven years ago on Sydney Television, ABC Television, there was a program about the Benedict, Benedictine monk, Father Freeman. Uh, he followed Father John Main in this worldwide movement of Christian meditation. And it was obvious from what the people uh, spoke on that program that in meditation they sensed the presence of the Holy Spirit. They, they sensed the unction of the Holy Spirit. Really, this Christian meditation begun by Father John Main is very simple. It's based on two phrases at the very end of the book of Revelation. 
The first one is the Holy Spirit and the bride say, Come, Lord Jesus. The bride, of course, is us. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is the bridegroom. And heaven is the, the nuptials of the, of the bridegroom and the bride. The Holy Spirit and the bride say, Come, Lord Jesus. Then a few sentences later, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Now there's a, an extraordinary truth here that the Holy Spirit wants to pray with us. Wants us to speak to Jesus so that we'll become more like Jesus. Come Lord Jesus means come into my life and make me like you Lord. And people who are like Jesus, we've all heard this beautiful text many times, but it's so important, Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace patient endurance, kindness, generosity, faith, mildness, and self-control. And that's what we all want, isn't it? And the Holy Spirit wants that. And so this Christian meditation is just sitting for 20 or 30 minutes each morning and each night and repeating Maranatha, Maranatha, with the Holy Spirit saying, Come Lord Jesus, come make me more like you. In the, um, for, at the first Holy Thursday, remember how when Jesus said he was going to leave this world and the disciples couldn't yet come with him and they became very disappointed. And then he said, but I will send the Holy Spirit who will lead you to the full truth. The Holy Spirit who will be active in us if we open our hearts to him. Lead us to the full truth and St. Paul takes that up. There's a beautiful chapter 8 in Romans. I remember when I was in the seminary, Doc Woodbury, it was uh, back in the uh, mid-40s and uh, we're reading, or just after the mid-40s, reading about Poland and the Baltic states under communism. And Doc Woodbury said to us, now what if you're going to be picked up by the secret police and sent to a gulag? What text of scripture would you like to take? Well, I think you couldn't do much better than Romans chapter 8. And in Romans chapter 8, Paul says, the Holy Spirit and our spirit testify that we are sons of the Father. See, once again, the Holy Spirit at work in us, the Holy Spirit praying in us, wanting us to understand that we can call God Abba. A very beautiful word. I was in doing some scripture studies in Jerusalem and I was in a confectionery shop and there was a little Jewish boy pulling his, father his father's trouser leg and pointing to some chocolates and I didn't know what he was saying but I could hear him saying Abba, Abba. Abba is the word that little children use of their loving father, their loving daddy. And that word is so beautiful that in 2,000 years it hasn't changed. They still use it. And St. Paul says in Romans 8, the Holy Spirit and our spirit testify that we are the sons and daughters of Abba. And then he goes on to speak of how the Holy Spirit and our spirit witness together that we are sons and daughters of the Father. And so St. Paul is into this teaching that is in the book, the end of the book of Revelation. Uh, the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, Lord Jesus. The Holy Spirit wants to pray with us. And you would remember in chapter 8 there's that expression, sometimes we don't know what to pray for. But St. Paul says, the Holy Spirit will intercede for us to the Father. You know, if you read chapter 8, the um, word that's used a, a number of times is groaning. The Greek word stenagmos, groaning. Uh, nature is groaning, says St. Paul. You know, this year we'll have floods, next year droughts, then an earthquake. Great, uh, nature is not perfect yet. Nature is groaning. And he, then he says, and we groan too. All the adults here have had that experience of groaning. Some big problem, maybe a teenage son or daughter, you don't know what to do. And then he goes on to make this extraordinary statement that the Holy Spirit will offer his groaning to the Father. 
and the Father knows what the Holy Spirit means. And the Father will cooperate with us so that all things work for good. Groaning indicates suffering, doesn't it? Now how can you say the Holy Spirit suffers? Well, in Ephesians, St. Paul said, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't get angry with us. The Holy Spirit gets disappointed with us when we are not the people we should be. And the Holy Spirit grieves for us. This is extraordinary theology, isn't it? The philosophers would tell you that God can't suffer. And one Sunday in Lent, you have the two readings. The first reading of, is of Abraham taking his son Isaac up to sacrifice him. And the end of it says, And God knew that Abraham loved him because he did not even spare his own son. We can imagine the grief of Abraham at that command. But then, the next reading in that Mass at Lent is St. Paul, chapter 8 of the Romans, where St. Paul quotes that. We know that God loves us because he did not even spare his own son. Somehow or other, the father, like Abraham, suffering for Isaac, uh, suffers when we, are, when we are not the people that we should be. Well, the Holy Spirit groans for us. And sometimes we can join in that groaning. The golden age of what is called the fathers, the fathers were the great theologians in the early centuries that hammered out Christian doctrine. And they often speak of the Holy Spirit. They were very conscious that the Holy Spirit within us wants to lead us, that we don't have to pray alone. The Holy Spirit will pray with us. The Spirit and the Bride Pray to the Father, come Lord Jesus. I'll read a couple of these uh, texts. Fulton Sheen says that an Irish bishop was giving confirmation once in a little country town and he, he read his homily, he read the whole lot. And uh, Maureen O'Hara said to Maggie McGee McGuigan, glory be to God, if the bishop can't remember it, how does he expect us to? Well, I don't remember these, so I'll read them. Uh, the old uh, mind starts to go, you might have heard that old time who said, to my dentures I'm accustomed, to deafness I'm resigned. I can put up with bad arthritis, but Lord, how I miss my mind. Older people would appreciate the difficulty of re remembering names. Well now, Athanasius. See, these are fourth century saints, mostly Greek. Uh, the Greek church still has that tremendous devotion to the Holy Spirit. Ignatius says, The descent of the Holy Spirit on Jesus in the River Jordan was for our benefit, to make us holy, so that we might share in his anointing. And of us it might be said, Do you not know you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? He dwells in you. One of the early martyrs, a, a Spanish martyr, um, his wife became a Christian first and he became and then they took their, their boy aged about 12 along to the uh, Easter Saturday Mass, which is very long. The boy was baptised there and he came home and the boy still uh, soon went down and slept. And suddenly the father got up and knelt before the boy and kissed his breast. And he said to his wife, isn't it wonderful? Our, our son is carrying the Holy Spirit. He's a temple of the Holy Spirit. Well now, Gregory of Nyssa says, Father, he, he quotes Jesus saying, Father, I have given them the Holy Spirit as you gave me the Holy Spirit. Basil the Great, as the Father makes himself present in the Son, so the Son makes himself present in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was a continual presence in the life of our Lord, being his anointing and his inseparable companion. And then he goes on to say, and the Lord wants us to be inseparable, com inseparable companions of the Holy Spirit. Like the Holy Spirit is our friend. Um, we can become intimate with him and he'll help us pray. And so these... Uh, 
I have a friend in Sydney who joined that meditation group begun by Father Main, and uh, she was operated on last year seriously. And she said, as she uh, waited for, uh, on the operation table, she was just quietly saying, Maranatha, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. And she said, I woke up after the operation, I found myself saying, Maranatha, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. The, the prayer can take over, especially if you're conscious that it's not you praying alone. It's the Holy Spirit praying with you. He wants you to be peaceful and loving and patient and have self-control and uh, bigness of thinking. Well, these um, Greek fathers uh, were very conscious that if we invite the Holy Spirit into our lives, he'll begin to help us with our prayer, uh, to take over with our prayer. I had a, a prayer group in the parish I was working in Japan and uh, one of the women, women came along and said, Father, I want you to visit the hospital. Uh, my close friend's husband is, is dying. Uh, he has cancer of the throat. They had to operate. He can't speak anymore. Uh, the marriage was very stormy. He uh, used violence against his wife. He would shout at her. And uh, he's dying in misery. Can you go and help him? And I went and uh, got nowhere. He just looked glumly at me, didn't show any interest whatsoever. And so I told the woman, Mrs. Horiguchi, uh, Horiguchi son, I'm sorry, but I, I tried. He's just not interested. And so she went to see him again. And she told me that he was uh, sitting back on his heels, as the Japanese do, because he had very bad bed sores. And she said, I just felt so sad. He had nothing to look forward to. Uh, death was just a horrible annihilation for him. And she said, I closed my eyes and I began to sing in tongues. You know, in charismatic prayer uh, groups, they often sing in tongues. And she said, I didn't mean to, but a very sad melody came out. And suddenly I realized that his head was on my breast. He leant forward. And she said, now he wants to see you. See, she turned the prayer over to the Holy Spirit. She lent her voice to the Holy Spirit, saying, Holy Spirit, please intercede with the Father. And when I went to see him, <coughs> he was a cha changed person. Uh, we baptized him. Horiguchi's son, his friend, uh, the wife's friend and the husband uh, became the sponsors. And some days later, I went to see him again. <coughs> And Anna said to me, what did you do to that man? He was our worst patient. Nothing pleased him. He was angry all the time. And now he's smiling. He's no trouble to us. What did you do to him? Well, it was the Holy Spirit who did it to him, wasn't it? See, that woman really brought that person to Christ, knowing, not knowing what to pray for, feeling the situation was hopeless. She asked the Holy Spirit to use her voice. It's interesting that when Latin went out of the Catholic Church, praying in tongues came back in. It was, used to be called jubilation. St. Augustine speaks of it, of inviting the Holy Spirit to just use your voice. Uh, it's nice to hear some of the Latin sung here. You know, the old Kyrie eleison, when I was a boy, we sang that. We didn't know Greek, but we knew it was prayerful. Sometimes it's, it's helpful to sing or pray without using your head, just using your heart. Based on that beautiful scripture teaching, the Holy Spirit and the bride say, Come, Lord Jesus. Or in chapter 8 of the Romans, the Holy Spirit and our spirit testify that we are sons of Abba. So, uh, Thomas Aquinas once said, you know, uh, if you've got to travel by boat, you can row if you like. And it takes a lot of energy and you end up with blisters. Or you can hoist a sail. And then the boat will go along much more quickly. And so he said that in prayer, you can go it alone and it's hard work. And there's not much joy in it. Or you can invite the Holy Spirit to come into your prayer life, to help you pray. As St. Paul does in Romans 8, 
and as the last chapter of the book of Revelation the spirit and the bride say come Lord Jesus Saint Luke especially is very sensitive to the Holy Spirit he's very sensitive to women and also to the Holy Spirit maybe there's a connection there that the gentleness that he has and in chapter 11 his great teaching on prayer you'd remember it the Lord is praying alone and when he finishes the disciples say Lord teach us to pray what do you do when you kneel down there by yourself for long periods and that's when the Lord first of all he gives the negative teaching or first of all there's a humorous incident the Lord Jesus had humor he said the traveler turns up very late at night to his friend and the friend has nothing to eat so he goes to his neighbor and knocks on the door and the neighbor doesn't answer for a while and finally says look we're all in bed and Jesus said if you keep knocking at that door he'll open up all right because he's not going to get any sleep and then he says what father among you would give your son a stone when he asks for bread or a scorpion when you, he asks for eggs that's the first promise the father won't betray us the father is not cynical uh, Einstein once said the creator is subtle but not cynical there's goodness in creation well then Jesus goes on to say therefore whenever you pray you will always receive does it say eggs sometimes we ask for eggs but the Lord knows we have bad cholesterol and eggs are bad for cholesterol often the things we ask for aren't helpful at all so if you read the end of that passage therefore every time you pray to the Father he will always give you the Holy Spirit that's the promise we're not promised things we're promised the person like if someone's dying the nurse might pump up the pillows a little bit that might help a little bit but like that dying Japanese man someone who's dying needs something far deeper than material comfort so we have these uh, beautiful texts in scripture about the Holy Spirit you know um, if you study the original Hebrew uh, or some of the Psalms for instance one word is used a lot Rahamim now you can't really translate that into English Rahamim comes from the root word the womb of a woman and Rahamim is the feeling of a woman for the child of her womb and time and time again in the Psalms the Holy Spirit tells us that the Father loves us with Rahamim I once heard an Irishman preaching and he says um, sure he says we're all related to Jesus on his mother's side <laughs> well Rahamim tells us that we're related to Jesus on his father's side see God is both mother and father isn't he and uh, motherly love is one of the most beautiful things there is uh, we all have a great love for our mother uh, she sticks by us through thick and thin and so the Holy Spirit in teaching us how much the Father loves us he is that very feminine uh, simile uh, we are the, the child of God's womb we are kin of the Father now the womb has another meaning the womb is dark and uh, the little child is terrified when it he's born the first act usually is to cry well so, so all of us have to go through worm, dark worm experiences for new birth it's only through suffering that we are deepened like that word compassion passion means suffering the passion of Jesus on the cross come together with and so our enemy is not suffering our enemy is lovelessness and meaninglessness there was that um, Jewish we heard that beautiful talk yesterday from Magdalene we'll hear it again this afternoon and um, Frankel was a, a Jewish psychiatrist who was put into Auschwitz and he just 
had the manuscript of his first book and the Nazis burned it in front of him. But in Auschwitz he said he learned something. That you can take suffering if there's some meaning to it. Like two Jews in Auschwitz, one has a wife outside still alive. The other has no wife. They both suffer the same terrible hardships. The one without hope dies, he said. And so Frankl began what he called logotherapy. Logo means meaning, the therapy of meaning. If there's meaning, you can take suffering. But if your life becomes meaningless, one of the saddest things I think in our modern society is uh, youth suicide. Um, when I was a boy, I never heard of a single youth taking his own life. I lived in a country town, the grapevine's always at work. Had some youth taken his life, we would have heard about it. But now right across the Western world, for so many young people, uh, there's no meaning. If your tooth is painful, you want it taken out. If your life is painful, you want to end it. The, the enemies, our enemies, are lovelessness and meaninglessness. And the Holy Spirit will take us through those new wormy experiences. We have to be reborn again. Now, all of us can remember back, say, when you saw The Wizard of Oz, the movie, uh, you were young. You remember how it impressed you and you, re you realize how you've changed. Things that um, were a big issue, like when you're a teenager, that the sense of um, uh, inferiority that many teenagers have because they're a bit scared of the future. All of us have to go through that, don't we? Um, mothers would remember taking their child for the first day to the kindergarten and there was a great flood of tears. The little child didn't want to stay there. Maybe mum was crying too. The Japanese have a beautiful saying. Send the child you love out on a journey. Unless you do that, the child will never mature. The child must suffer. But it's not meaningless suffering. The child must learn to be alone uh, without the mother. And so that word rahamim tells us how we are kin of God. We are of the same family. He loves us as much as a, lover, a mother loves her child. But it also reminds us of the darkness in life. We've all got to suffer. See that word that is in Romans 8. Nature is groaning. You know those poor people over there in South America just been through that earthquake. They know what that means, nature is groaning. That earthquake killed many of their family, wrecked their homes. And then Paul says, and we are groaning too. I'm sure if I said, uh, hands up any adult who's never groaned. I don't think any hands would go up. We've all suffered, haven't we? But the Holy Spirit teaches us to make our wounds into wellsprings. See that word compassion. Unless you've suffered, you don't really have compassion. There was an ancient Greek saying, the wounded doctor heals. And that's why uh, the Dutch priest who wrote those beautiful books wrote that book, Wounded Healer. If you've been wounded, you have sympathy and understanding. And so suffering's not our enemy. The Holy Spirit uh, teaches us that suffering too has a meaning. I was once in a sissy and you remember that uh, the Canticle of the Sun, Francis wrote that beautiful poem, Praise Lord for Brother Sun and Sister Moon, for Sister Water who was so humble and so useful. No, he didn't have Brother Fire in, in the first edition of that. And this Franciscan told me that he was going blind. And the Pope had been Cardinal Hugolin, who was a great friend of Francis, sent six of the best doctors from Rome up to Assisi to try to arrest his loss of sight. And uh, things were rather grim in those days and doctors believed that if you got two red hot plates and pressed them momentarily on the temples, uh, there could be healing. And the Franciscan with him had to leave the room. The, the sizzling sound of burning flesh and the, and the smell. And after that, Francis said, 
and praise you, Lord, for Brother Fire. See, Francis didn't pray, praise the Lord just for fine days. He prayed, praise the Lord, for storms too. Storms are part of life. Part of uh, what strengthens us. You know, sometimes um, I think it's important to... Um, well, one Indian Jesuit once said in a retreat in Japan, the, mi the mind is a very good place for prayer to start, but a very poor place for prayer to end up. Real prayer ends up in the heart. When you met your wife or your husband for the first time, you know, you looked him up and down, or looked her up and down, and thought, oh, not too bad. And then, but gradually, you begin to keep company, and something happens. Uh, love begins. In Japan, over half the marriages are arranged marriages. Now, many Westerners have wrong ideas about these arranged marriages. A very wise matchmaker will be asked by parents, could you find a suitable man or daughter for my child? And he usually is uh, pretty good in picking what kind of people will meet together. Now, they both write out all the details on a piece of paper. Uh, about F4 size, you know, wh when they were born, what school they went to, what they did at university, what their sports are. Now, they exchange those. They haven't met yet. When both read the other's report and think this might be okay, they'll give the go-ahead and they'll meet. Now, reading that piece of paper, there's no love whatsoever. Just curiosity. But they begin to keep company. And then something happens in their heart. They read that with the head. They've got to do that. But that's not the most important part of life, is it? Gradually, love, love is born. And so sometimes it's good, I think. I remember in the charismatic renewal, I first thought praying in tongues was very queer, if not odd, and maybe dangerous. But then reading St. Augustine, he used the word jubilation. Some, Augustine's first book was on the Catholic faith. And in that first book he wrote, he said, miracles are no longer needed today. They were needed in the early church. But then he wrote a second book, Retractions, because in his church, during Mass, miracles would take place. The blind would suddenly see. And he'd stop the Mass and they'd go into jubilation to praise the Lord. And so, sometimes it's good uh, to get away from the head, that Jesuit in Japan said, you Westerners, lose your mind and come to your senses. <laughs> and there's truth in that. Uh, when Pope John Paul came to Japan, he told the, the nuns, now preserve your beautiful tradition of deep contemplation. Uh, many of you would have read John Paul's apostolic letter on the rosary. It was um, about 62 pages. And in that he used the word contemplation 39 times. We're called a contemplation. Uh, I was at a retreat once in Japan. A famous Jesuit gave it, William Johnston. And he said to us, if you baptize a Japanese adult and don't teach them contemplation, you are irresponsible. He said... Christians are called to live the Sermon on the Mount. And he said, unless you are into contemplative prayer, you can't turn your face when one side is slapped. You can't rejoice when you're persecuted. But that's what we're called to. The Cardinal told us that we, call, we are called to be saints. John Paul kept insisting on that. Baptism is a call to holiness. And so this... Uh, idea of the rosary as contemplative prayer. In contemplative prayer you don't use the head. You say the rosary mechanically without thinking of the words but your heart is there. Today, Divine Mercy Sunday. Remember Jesus told Sister Faustina that she lo he loves to hear the prayer, Jesus I trust in you. We used to call that uh, saying an aspiration once. I remember learning from the nuns to say those, Jesus, have mercy. Jesus, heart of Jesus, I love you. 
In those, you're not using your head, you're using your heart. Uh, the Holy Spirit didn't wait until Christian missionaries came to go to work in Asia. He loved the Asian people. Now in Japan, there's a very simple prayer to Amida, one of the Buddhas. It's just, Namu Amida Butsu, Namu Amida Butsu. And they have a rosary. They count 108 times because the Buddhas say that we have 108 sinful uh, impulses. Uh, they call that bonno, which is our, we have the word, uh, original sin, don't we? Now, if you write the Japanese ideograph for saying that Buddhist prayer, you wrote two symbols. The first one is now, the second one is heart. That defines prayer. Prayer is of the heart and now. You might have heard that expression, some Christians are like uh, Jesus on the cross. They're surrounded by two thieves. The thief of yesterday and the thief of tomorrow. I think you know what that means. Some people, instead of praying now, uh, the Lord is here, I've closed the door, he's in this room, he will re reward me. They're worried about their mistakes yesterday or what might happen tomorrow. And that's the meaning of that expression. Some people are like Jesus on the cross. They're surrounded by two thieves the thief of yesterday and the thief of tomorrow. And so that Buddhist prayer, uh, the Nembutsu, so the ideographs, now and heart. That's real prayer, not now and mind. And so that little expression, uh, Jesus, I trust in you, is a beautiful prayer. You can just repeating it. Uh, these people who belong to John Main's um, worldwide meditation group they're spreading around the world they're in New Zealand so they sit for 20 or 30 minutes every morning and every night and just saying Maranatha Maranatha come Lord Jesus and they're saying it with the Holy Spirit they're the bride the bride and the spirit say come Lord Jesus so we're not meant to pray alone we're meant to pray with the Holy Spirit Paul, in that um, great letter uh, to, to the Romans, look, it's good to pick up a, a piece of the Bible, just one chapter, and pray prayerfully. You've heard the expression Lexio Divina. Lexio Divina comes, it's the Latin word meaning uh, reading about the Lord. But the monks began it. And Lexio Divina is when you take a book and you don't rush through it. You pray while you're reading it. And then that book really speaks to the heart because the Holy Spirit is there. The, they spoke of, of once of a book that had unction that makes you sense the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit our friend, who is our friend, who wants to live intimately with you. As that Greek father said, Jesus lived intimately with the Holy Spirit. He, he's our friend. He's not out to, to zap us. He sometimes suffers. Paul used the word that's used in Isaiah, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit appeals to us. He doesn't threaten us. And he will lead us into the full truth. I think that um, that story I told you about Ignatius of Loyola, which was the turning point of his life, he began to read a book on the Lord. There's no point in hurrying. He was in, going to be in that hospital for months. He read it slowly. And gradually began to speak to his heart. And he said, I began to think, this is true. This is important. I've never thought of this before. This is on comparison with novels. Novels are made up like our television dramas. And then gradually begin to say, maybe I could l live like this. And he said, when he read Francis of Assisi, this man was happy and I'm not happy. I'm always dissatisfied. Maybe if I tried to live like Francis... That was the turning point. See, that was Lexia Divina. Reading something prayerfully. And uh, finally, we've got the great Polish trifecta, haven't we? Uh, John Paul II, Maximilian Kolbe, and Saint Faustina. John Paul II told his secretary, and all those people that would come to see him, he would always begin praying when he saw them coming, just in his heart. And that's why he had an extraordinary effect on people. 
There's never been a funeral in history like John Paul's, has there? Remember some of those, when he was dying, I remember one television commentator said to this modern young girl wearing jeans and all jazzed up, a real typical modern, modern why are you crying? And she said, because my father is dying. Young people knew that John Paul had the truth. Some of his teaching demanded sacrifice, but it brought deep peace of heart. So we ask you, Holy Spirit, and we thank you for all these wonderful people spending their time on Divine Mercy Sunday in, in this hall where the Father is present and Jesus and you too. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to lead us into contemplative prayer, prayer of the heart, prayer of love. Thank you, everyone.